Before the drought, caused by a shortage of rainfall, comes a drought of ideas. Chhatar Singh is a shepherd farmer in the deep Thar Desert in our state of Rajasthan. And he sent in these words through a letter that was read out in a conference that met to discuss the farmer's deaths in Maratwada. You see, Singh was very, very disturbed at the news of the deaths because he himself had come out of two years of drought and he wanted to offer his experience as a solution. This is where Chatar Singh lives, in the deep Thar Desert, a place that is dotted by dunes, hard rock, and dry grasslands, and which gets just 80 millimeters of rainfall in a year. If you hark back to the three slides, we get nearly 1,000 mm. Kochi gets nearly 3,000 mm. Maratwara gets almost 10 times this. And yet, there is no water scarcity in the place where Chatar Singh lives. In the two years of drought, they didn't have to call for a water tanker from the state even a single time. Here's the dichotomy. How does a farmer from the deep Thar Desert go two years in, of, a of a drought without wanting for water when there are places in India which get so much more water and the farmers, as well as the people, suffer. Let's talk about water. More specifically, let's talk about how the tar achieves this miracle. I want to tell you a story today of Chhatar Singh and what he has done in the desert. So we are in one of the driest parts of India. This is the deep Thar Desert. It's beyond Jaisalmer, close to the border with Pakistan. It's a place, as we saw, gets very little rainfall. In fact, many years, the amount of rain that starts falling from the skies evaporates even before it reaches the parched earth. It's that kind of place. It's a place which is home to shepherds who have their goats, sheep, Cows, camels, which is what they call their walking gold. Hamara chalta hua sona is what they call it because that's their mainstay. And so, of course, food and water for their animals is really important. And this is the kind of land we're talking about. Flat land, hard rock. This, believe it or not, is a catchment. It's not lush green forests. It's not lush grasslands. It's not what you think of as a catchment. This hard rock land is a catchment for the desert. And it slopes gently. When the rain does fall, what little falls here, it falls on this land and then it rolls off a gentle slope of maybe a foot over a kilometer. It rolls into this. This is a man-made depression, a lake which is primed and ready to catch every little drop of rain that may fall in a year. Believe it or not, that 80 millimeters could come in just a single day. And then no rain for the rest of the year. So one day of rain. And that land that they prep, they mark it with that pillar in the middle. That one. It's called a goidhan, and it's supposed to denote a sacred place. This is a place that is a place of water. Do not desecrate it. This is sacred to us, they say. It's not that they worship water. In fact, they don't. It is that they respect it. And when the rain does come and fills up the water, the, the lake, they use the lake, use the water, and all the villages around it use it. It's a community lake. It's not, it doesn't belong to one person or one community. It, it's the whole community, all all the people in the village use it. And then, of course, as water evaporates or it gets uh, absorbed into the land, it's gone. So about eight months after the rains, there's no water. And this puts them right in the middle of summer. Blazing heat in Rajasthan and there's no water in the lake. Is that when they call in the tankers? Nope. That's when this structure takes over. These are berries or shallow percolation wells which tap the water that is sitting above a gypsum layer that runs through Jaisalmer. And as the women 
pull up water from the well, the well pulls in water from the saturated earth around it. If you put your ear to this well, after women have pulled up water, you can actually hear the drops falling in. And it's a wonderful sound. It's the sound of rejuvenation. It's a metaphor almost for the giving earth. One day, Chatar Singh and I hiked up the steep side of a dune. It was a blazing June day, 48 degrees. And we went and sat up there. And I was wondering why we were here. I had stopped asking Chatar Singh why, why we were going somewhere. He always had a reason. And we were sitting up there and he started digging the dune. And not six inches in, he came up with moist sand. And this was 22 months after they had had any serious rain. Maybe they had a millimeter here and three millimeters there, but there was no serious rain. This was in the middle of the drought and there six inches inside a dune was moist sand. It stunned me. And then sure enough, we walked down the other side of the dune and there was a well. Hand dug by shepherds. You see these shepherds take their flock of sheep and goat and they walk hundreds of kilometers in this district. They know the land. They know how it functions. They know where to look for water. And there in the most unlikely place, for us unlikely, under a dune is a well. And you can see that it's, it's just been it's just been used. There's water around. It. There was water in this well. I peeked not three feet down. Was water. And this is after 22 months of drought. Summer. Summer is the time for preparation. In this area, they know that maybe they'll get one day of rain. And so they have to prep the land. So what do these shepherds do? They collect thorny acacia bushes and they line the long side of a depression, man-made depression, they clean out the depression, and then they line the long side of the depression with this thorny acacia, and they wait for nature to do her thing. Because what's coming after summer are the sandstorms. And once the sandstorms start up, the wind just throws the sand at the acacia bushes, and guess what? A bund begins to build, because the sand starts accumulating in that, you know, the, the obstruction it has found. And a bund begins to build. And once the sandstorms die down, the shepherds come and they fortify the bund. Because when that one day of rain comes and the water rolls down the catchment and stops at that bund, they don't want the bund to breach. So they fortify it. They don't even know if they'll get that one day of rain. But in summer, they prep themselves, they prep the land. And this, I'm standing on a bund when I've taken this picture. Um, and guess what? You know how old this bund is? 700 years old. This method of rainwater harvesting in the desert is ancient. It's not new. And this bund has been there for all these years. It has held up. And this, uh, this place where the, the rain comes and stops is called a kadin. And then the shepherds wait longer. For the next two or three months, they just wait for all this rainwater to seep into the earth. The earth drinks deeply. It is parched. It drinks deeply. It saturates itself. And once, once, the, rain, once, once the rainwater is gone, that is when the shepherds plant their crops. I spoke to Chatar Singh two days ago. He was in his kadin planting mustard. He had waited. It was an amazing year for uh, this, the, the, for Jaisalmer this year. There was a lot of rain, and he was planting. And then they wait another three months, and after which there are crops. What do they plant? They plant wheat. They plant mustard. They plant gram. They plant dhania. And if there's not that much rain, there hasn't been that much rain. They don't think there's that much water in the earth. They plant guar bean. So they know. They gauge. They, they listen to the land. They know what's, what it's telling them. And that's when they plant. In that same village of Ramgarh, there is another desert. And this is the government's idea of greening the desert. Someone sitting in an ivory tower far away decided that they were going to pipe water from the Himalaya down to the desert 
to green the desert, for agriculture in the desert. And so hundreds of thousands of crores of rupees later, the Indra Gandhi Canal is supposed to bring water from the Himalaya to Ramgarh for agriculture. The bad news, there isn't nearly enough water for Rajasthan in the Indira Gandhi Canal. And what the canals look like and the sub-canals, the little ones, look like right now are either they're rivers of sand or they're choked with hyacinth, they're thick with algae, or they're putrid with the carcasses of animals that have fallen into the canal. What water does reach villages, it smells, it stinks. The people who have bought into Chatar Singh's dream and have nurtured their local sources of water, they won't sip or touch one drop of this. They don't use this for cooking, drinking, anything. Maybe they'll wash their camel cart with it, but they will not use it for anything else. But just like in every society, there are people who went whole hog and bought into the government's promises and dreams, and they depend upon the canal for water, for their irrigation. And as of 16th November 2017, three days ago, an article in the newspaper says that there is an agitation in Jaisalmer district, specifically Ramgarh, because these farmers don't have water. There is no water in the canal. And this year has been a great rain year for Jaisalmer. In the same year, I asked Chatar Singh day before yesterday to send me these images. This is his khadim. This is the amount of water. He is sowing his seeds. He has water. The people who are dependent upon the canal, they're agitated. They're in a hunger strike even as we sit in this room listening. to The other irony is that the people, when they ran out of water, they didn't have water in the canal, they came to Chatar Singh's khadim and asked for water. Those people are... Uh, farmers who depend upon the canal. They came to the Kadeen to get water. So there you have it. Survival in a drought-prone region teaches us a few things. Primarily, number one, which is not on this, is listen to the land. Listen to what the land says. But in city after city, state after state, country after country, everywhere in the world, people divorced from the land, sitting in ivory towers, are making plans for the land. And when planning is divorced from the land, what do we get? We get floods in Chennai. We get droughts in California, which are supposed to be a paradise, right? We get droughts in, in California. We get dust bowls in China. And the tragedy, we get people dying in Marathwada. And this list is hardly exhaustive. For one, it does not include Namma Uru Bengaluru. And we all know what's happening here. We, this year, had record rainfall, 1,200 millimeters. We normally get under 1,000. Under we got 1,200 millimeters, but there's no change in our groundwater level. There is no extra water availability. In fact, literally, water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. Get this. Let this sink in. We get 3 billion liters per day of rain, averaged over the year. We consume 1.8 billion liters a day. We get nearly double what we need from the rain. But clearly, as even the desert has shown us, it's not about how much we get. It's about what we do with it. And what do we do with it? Even 15 years ago, the wetlands of Agara Lake, Belandur, and Vartur are kind of connected by wetlands. We can see that. And in 2017, what have we done? We have sucked it dry, filled it up, built around it, and now we defecate in it. These lakes are cut, uh, cut off from each other. They're not connected anymore in the way they were. They should be. And what are we getting? And then, of course, this list of lakes, the lakes of Kempe Gauda's Bangalore and all his descendants, it's been con converted into layouts and stadiums and bus stands and you name it. That's what we've done to our local sources of water. We have gone against every one of those tenets of survival in a drought-prone region. And we are in a drought-prone region. So what have we done? We've shut off local sources of water. We've defiled them. We have sucked up our reserves. 400,000 bore wells sucked our land dry. They're still sucking our land dry. And we've relied on a single source, the Kaveri, so far away, and the government. So where do we go from here? 
I know it's all doom, and doom right now, right? Not so, not so. That's what is, and we all know this, the frothing and the foaming of our lovely lake. And this is what can be, and what can be is not really very far away. That is Jakku. The community came together, the residents, the locals, everybody has come together. They're still working to clean this lake, make it viable. And that's happening in quite a few lakes around town. You see, Kempe Gauda, when he established this city and all his descendants, they knew that Bangalore sits atop 3,000 feet of granite gneiss. All the rain that falls is likely to just go off. They created lakes, cascading lakes. They created thousands of wells because they knew that the denizens of this city will need water and they need to provide for it. We do not have a perennial source of water. We do not have a perennial river running through Bangalore. And so they thought about that. They listened to the land. They studied the land. They knew where to build the lakes. And they built it. And it functioned for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. Until maybe 1950, when Bangalore began to boom. And then we started forgetting our local sources of water. We started depending on just one reservoir, then another reservoir, and then finally the river far away. We did not nurture our wells. We built over it. We did not nurture our lakes. You know what we did. So I'm going to leave you with this. What if? What if we as a community took a pledge? What if we decided to join the efforts that are reclaiming our lakes and our commons? What if we began to resurrect our open wells, going back to what the land is telling us to do? And then closer to home, many of us live in things that look like this or have a roof or have a uh, terrace. I'm standing on a circle, uh, it may be one meter by one meter. If the 1,200 millimeters of rain fell here, I would have that many liters of water to drink if I collected it, right? It's just that much. Surely we have a roof that's bigger than this. What if Bangalore, we prepare now, we have to prepare now to collect the rain that is going to fall in 2018. What if we prepare to collect every drop of rain? Thank you.